Okay, um, so this is the last lecture that we're going to have for Christian ethics. Uh, and we're going to be talking today about um, the book that you have to write the book review about, Public Faith in Action. Um, we are going to be talking about it in very general terms, kind of a sweeping summary um, of lots of parts of it, uh, some individual chapters as well. Um, on the critical review, uh, probably focus more of your attention to actually uh, more critically engaging with it. Um, so hopefully you'll have that going on. This is the book by Miroslav Wolf and Ryan McNally Lins. Um, so just give you a little bit of background about where this book came from uh, to understand a little bit of that. Um, so Miroslav Wolf, uh, if you're unfamiliar with him, he's at Yale University. Uh, his kind of uh, most well-known book, his breakout book you would call it, is Exclusion and Embrace, which dealt with uh, reconciliation and using as a backdrop for that the uh, conflicts of the Balkans during the early 90s um, was a, a big part of the, the backdrop for that. Um, it, you know, won, won a number of awards, really made a name for himself. Uh, so he's over at Yale University. Uh, Ryan McNally Liz is actually uh, was at the time the research assistant for uh, you know Professor Volf um, over there. Uh, they're still at at uh, Yale um, in the Nevada School, which is kind of that uh, neo evangelical or um, post evangelical, sometimes called uh, post liberal, uh, sometimes also called. Um, movement that's there um, where they are kind of you know it's not exactly evangelicalism but it's definitely not liberalism uh, that's kind of going on over there at Yale um, so anyway the, the book actually started uh, and I think the authors may actually mention this early on it started as a series of uh, Facebook posts um, that were linked together and then they garnered a lot of attention a lot of conversation around it and so they uh, decided to bring it together into a single book um, but you can kind of see where they, they did edit it some, but you can see through some of the ways that it addresses different topics that it was, you know, distinct uh, posts on social media, which is why some of them to be uh, fairly short. Um, there is a heavy emphasis on what they call unsegmented life or holistic life, the idea of not breaking down different aspects of your life into these different segments. So it's not like you, you know, segment off your Christian faith from your politics and you segment that off from how you interact with others, that these are all connected and they should be connected. And what does that mean and what does that look like, um, kind of at a day to day standpoint? Um, so there's a conviction uh, at the heart of the book um, that all actions are public. Um, so I think I said, uh, so some of those are active, uh, they're much more out there, um, and others are more passive. Um, but regardless of whether it's an active or passive act, um, whether you intend for it to be public or not, it is in fact public to one extent or another because of the continued or residual effects of that action. Um, there's a threefold structure to the book, um, and we're going to kind of go through each of those. There's commitments, convictions, and character. Uh, and so that's kind of the, what it, it follows through is the their basic commitments, the specific convictions they have about specific topics here. They get a little bit more uh, in depth into individual issues, uh, and then talking about overall character and here they're talking about the individual character that kind of thing so uh, we're going to go through uh, each of the chapters uh, probably going to go fairly quickly because otherwise this would just go on and on and on and on um, so chapter one um, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on the, the earlier chapters for the kind of laying out some of this groundwork but the idea is that faith has this public dimension um, and that you can't separate the um, you know, the, the private faith from the public and political actions, and that's a big part of this. Um, they also want to note that the Christian faith, if you're going to live it out in public action and do so intentionally, you are going to live it out in, the, in public action, but whether you do it intentionally or not, if you do it intentionally, um, you're not going to fit neatly into the secular politics one way or the other. That kingdom, and specifically kingdom of God, is by its very nature a subversive political term. Um, so that's a big part of that. Um, and, you know, to look at this this conflict between uh, religious faith and secular politics, you need to no, look no further than um, than Jesus Christ. And he has heavy conflict with both the religious authorities and the state authorities, um, ultimately culminating in his crucifixion. Um, and this conflict, uh, ar argues Wolfen and McNally-Lenz, 
um, is a model for Christian interaction uh, with all corrupt kingdoms. And every kingdom is corrupt except the kingdom of God. Um, and so they talk about this conflict in uh, you know, terms of eternality and final and universal. Um, this is, again, using a lot of uh, Aristotelian language, uh, uh, Aquinian Thomist language, uh, to talk about these different things. Um, they also want to make the point that they are not advocating that you change your faith to adapt to the culture and politics. Rather, it's the other way around. Um, the way they put it is Christ does not adapt to culture, but rather changes culture in order to adapt to him. Uh, and this is, if you've ever read um, Christ and Culture, uh, this is kind of looking at that you know, Christ over culture sort of thing. Um, that Jesus Christ changes the culture, not the other way around. Uh, the idea of, of Bart's concentric circles, and this is where I really wish uh, I had like a whiteboard or something to show you, but you have kind of in the center circle, uh, you have dogma. Um, and dogma are, this is what you have to have to be a Christian. Without these things, you are no, not, you can't even claim Christian faith. And these are usually kept pretty narrowly. Um, so you might say, you know, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has come again. Uh, the kind of credo that's in the Book of Common Prayer. Is a pop common one that's used for that. Um, some people want to put the Trinity in there. Some people want to put others in there. But you usually want to keep this list pretty small. Um, these are not just essentials, but even deeper down essentials. Um, that without them, you don't have Christianity. Okay. Um, the next circle out, and there's three circles total. So this kind of middle circle is what they call doctrine. Uh, and doctrine are these issues that are important. Um, and there's varying levels of importance with them. Some you can still, you know, say that someone's a heretic if they don't accept it, that sort of thing. But these are not um, anti-Christian. These are not against the cause of Christ. But they, so the disagreement is going to happen here. Sometimes radical disagreement, and these are still important things. Uh, and this is probably more so where people are going to put a specific interpretation of the Trinity or um, understanding of salvation by, uh, you know, Faith alone and sanctification by faith alone, that Lutheran view, versus the more uh, Wesleyan view, you have salvation by faith alone, justification by faith alone. And sanctification is a this cooperation between um, you know, what, what you do and what the Spirit does in you, that, that kind of thing. But these are all fit in this doctrine area. They're still important. They're very important. Um, people might not be able to fellowship if they disagree without, about them, but they're not as important as this dogmatic area. And then that kind of bigger circle, that third circle, is where the realm of opinions and politics and that kind of thing are. And these are things where we should be able to disagree, but still maintain fellowship with one another. And they recognize that a lot of what they're going to be talking about is probably going to fit into that third category, but it's nevertheless informed by these inner two categories. They kind of reach out into that third area. And that should be how you understand that dogma informs your doctrine, informs your politics in this instance. Um, and so that's kind of how, how all of that works. Okay, uh, so they kind of lay that out in chapter 1. Chapter 2, um, they talk about how uh, we embody Christ in us, um, that where is Christ located? This is a big question in Christian theology. We talk about where is Christ. Uh, they want to talk about that Christ is embodied in us um, by our actions and what we do. Uh, and again, going back to these... Uh, Aristotelian or Thomist understanding that the goal of life, the goal of Christian action, is that uh, you know, eudaimonia, human flourishing, um, at the end of it. And they use that term flourishing uh, kind of throughout there. Um, the central theme of flourishing along three axes, uh, and they look to um, you know, these kind of different ways that people understand human flourishing. So for Kant, is it something like leading life well? For Marx, they're going to draw that this is life going well, um, but really uh, joy is about life is you know feeling good. So they, they organize around these three axes, but all three, the mistake of you know Kant or Marx is that they isolated these apart from any others. And so instead, they, they want to focus on all three of these. They're, they're all three important. They, should, they all three fit into, um, so all three of these, uh, life lived well, life going well, and the, the good feeling of life, that these all three fit together under human flourishing. But they're not distinct things, but they all fit together as part of that. And they, the three work together to produce this idea of shalom. Uh, and that's the big point that they want to get to, is that um, shalom, or peace, or all things right, this Hebrew concept of this is what produces shalom, 
is what produces human flourishing, as it were. Okay, moving on to chapter 3. Um, so, they want to talk a lot about the context, and this is really where they're deriving a lot of their thought from, and they want to lay that out and be very open about that. Um, so, they're understanding the canonical context, they're talking about the biblical canon here, um, that they're going to give priority to the New Testament. So, if there is an apparent conflict, uh, between how old the New Testament are, so the New Testament is going to have priority over that. Um, there's, a, a, we'll ask some of these questions later, but um, they also want to understand contemporary context that they're in. So they have this idea of a democratic ideal. This is something that is, you know, somewhat foreign to the idea of the New Testament, um, but nevertheless something that we do feel is correct. That this idea of having a democratic or republican, democratic or federalist ideal or something, what you know, whatever terms you want to put it into. They also want to acknowledge that there are complex social systems at play in our present world that are absent from the biblical worldview. Um, along with it, there are technological developments, and this is something that's going to have a factor in all of this. Um, even you know, more removed from these democratic political ideals um, are how do we address technology within that. Um, so that's kind of laying out these initial commitments and just kind of these are the sort of questions that they're asking. And then they move into more specific issues. So um, chapter 4 is concerned with wealth. Uh, the idea is that wealth is not necessarily condemned. And you recall some of the earlier readings that we had, um, like Wesley's sermon, uh, you know, earn all you can, save all you can, um, give all you can, that kind of thing. Uh, but they also want to say that you know, it's not wrong to enjoy things in life. Um, this is a big point for them. And you, you don't necessarily have to agree, but we're just kind of going through the summary here that it is all right to spend things on luxuries so long as you are aware of the ways that this can be perverted um, and abused and um, overused. So if you're using it against someone else, then that's, that's a problem. And they do acknowledge the room for debate there. Um, the fifth chapter talks about the environment, and they're just going to jump straight into it. The idea that creation participates uh, in God's story of redemption is part of this canonical biblical commitment that they have. Um, and then they also want to point to the economic factor. And this is something that when we talked about environmental ethics, we, we addressed a little bit, um, that you kind of have this problem with both environmental you know, factors disproportionately affect the poor, um, that you know, global warming, global climate change, whatever you want to call it, has a disproportionate effect upon the poor. But at the same time, there is an economic disparity there that can you require the same um, sort of commitments uh, environmentally upon poorer countries that you did not require uh, or that were not required during the industri uh, initial industrial uh, revolution uh, in like you know Europe especially England uh, and later the Americas um, that they didn't have to contend with those sorts of things they do acknowledge that there's a big wealth disparity and that this is part of which is why they pair these chapters next to each other is that wealth uh, disparity is part of an environmental issue as well um, they point to the fact that if, and they're not advocating for redistribution of wealth, but they are acknowledging that if you were to redistribute wealth um, completely equitably, this would mean $16,000 per person. That's how much wealth there is in the world once you take all the billions and billions of dollars out there. Um, which for a family of four is about $64,000, which is a fairly reasonable income um, right now. So. Uh, they're, they're, again, they're not advocating for that. They're just wanting to kind of bring this as part of the debate as well. We talk about those things. Uh, moving on to chapter six, uh, talking about education. Um, and they want to talk about the foundation of education is the formation of character, which leads to flourishing. This whole, uh, you know, Thomist or Satilian idea of education is at the heart of that. Uh, and that this has a knock-on effect. So you have flourishing of individuals, which leads to flourishing of communities. That there is a sense in which uh, the world has a vested interest in education, which is why there should be you know, funding and support for it. Um, so regardless of whether you have children um, or have ever had children, you nevertheless benefit from, the, from having an educated populace and from having children that are educated. Uh, you can point to this very pragmatically and look at the way that you know, the funds trace. Um, so... That's one aspect of it. That some of the other aspects of education is that we can't ignore the character building aspect of education, which they readily acknowledge is something that has kind of gone by the wayside in a lot of American uh, American today. Uh, and the idea that you have to have equitable access. Um, you're never going to have fully equitable education, but you should have equal access to education there. 
Um, there should be a high quality education. That it shouldn't be based solely upon wealth. Um, and that's where that affordability of education. Here they, they start reaching into beyond K-12 education, but also higher education as well. Um, that should be something that doesn't cripple someone financially. Um, and also one point that education is not just about the formal government setting. Um, it it kind of goes beyond that as well. Moving on to chapter 7. And I don't want to dwell too long on any one of these chapters. Um, okay, so chapter 7 is about work and rest. And they want to note that the, the rhythm established in the book of Genesis is this rhythm of work and rest and work and rest. And this is part of how we are created. They also want to make a clear distinction between work and employment. Um, that work is something different from employment. And I think that these next chapters, uh, chapter 7, chapter 8, even a little bit of chapter 9, um, that these are, are especially prescient uh, in the current time where we're having this you know, massive economic downturn um, related to the, the stay-home orders, the lockdown orders, or whatever they, they're called, wherever. Um, the idea that work is still valuable, work is still being done, even if people are not being paid for such work. Um, and they do list some of the concerns that uh, people should have access to employment. Uh, now, what does this mean? What does this look like? What does this look like during uh, when you have a distinction between essential and non-essential work and that kind of thing? Um, they also believe that work should be meaningful. Uh, I think that we are finding that some of these jobs that maybe perhaps people did not previously think was meaningful, they're starting to find more meaning in. Uh, I think in particular things like grocery stock workers, and things like that, where um, I know some people previously had a hard time seeing or finding meaning, and now they're starting to find meaning uh, in that work. This idea of vocation, uh, and whether or not vocation should be tied to um, you know, what others view as valuable. Like, can you find value in work, and uh, what should that work look like? This is going to be a continued concern as economies start to reopen. Uh, things that were previously deemed perhaps non-essential, are people going to be able to find the same meaning in them? Uh, these are just interesting things to look at. Uh, they talk about how employment and pay should be fair. This is meant to be kind of an ideal. They do acknowledge that it's not always fair. Uh, and, and as I've already mentioned, they do uh, want to recognize and value non-employed work. Uh, things that people do that they are not paid for. Um, whether this is home maintenance, whether this is um, taking care of children at home, uh, well, this is volunteer work that people do, different things like that. Uh, and they do want to acknowledge that everyone should have the opportunity for a true rest. Um, and that the idea of a seven-day work week is, is, is you know, right out. Um, but you have to think beyond just the number of days of employment. Again, they're talking bigger terms of work and what a, a true rest is going to look like in those different contexts. Um, and the focus of rest being a genuine rest. Um, Okay, moving on. Chapters 8 and 9, uh, which kind of go well together. Um, so talking about poverty and borrowing and lending. Um, and they talk about poverty being tied to the incarnation, that Jesus was uh, born to poor circumstances. The, the use of turtle doves at the um, offering of Jesus is something reserved for the poorest of the poor. So he was born to humble circumstances, um, born to a, a you know, poorer family. Uh, and they talk about the difference between asset poverty. This is not just about how much money is in the bank, but what things can be passed on. Uh, and this is where the biggest distinction in, in wealth disparities are in America. And they talk about you know poverty and its ties to social standing, how these things are often wrapped up together. Um, they do actually recommend some specific policy reforms. Um, in particular, they want to say that a lot of American politics, less so now, but still very much so, it still dominates the political cycle when people talk about uh, economics, is that the middle class often ends up being the focus of economic talk, and they kind of question whether that is, is right-headed or not. Um, and they want to talk about positive action, so not just addressing problems as they arise, but trying to do things to change the overall situation, and that, that should be the, the norm. Uh, and that there should be some and in efforts to address poverty, there needs to be something that looks at overall assets as well, how to build asset wealth as well. Um, and they also really want to avoid this language of the deserving poor. Um, that, you know, giving to the poor or pro welfare programs to the poor is, should, should really avoid this language of des deserving because it's dehumanizing, um, specifically. 
Um, chapter nine addresses uh, you know borrowing and lending, and they do want to talk about distort, distorted borrowing and distorted lending. Like if you have a credit card problem, that's distorted borrowing. We need to figure out ways to address this. Distorted lending is those kind of payday loans that prey on people who are at their worst. Um, and what should be done about these different things. Um, moving right along uh, to talking about marriage. I know I'm going a little bit fast paced, but this is just broadly summary. So hopefully you'll be able to, any that you want to talk more in depth in your, uh, your review papers, hopefully you'll be able to address those there. Um, so talk about marriage and the family. Um, they want to start off by saying, of course, mar Christians affirm marriage. Um, but they do want to draw a distinction between um, some understandings of marriage which they feel are not helpful and those that are more helpful. So the focus of marriage is not on just birthing a lot of children. And they want to make that clear that both the Old Testament and the New Testament are pretty unanimous in this. That marriage is primarily for companionship. It is not primarily for the continuation of the species. The New Testament talks in terms of child raising, not child bearing. And so the point of marriage is um, you know, companionship, the point of family is the raising of a child, not just the bearing of a child. And this is, again, that holistic living aspect that comes up there. Um, and it's also, they want to point to the idea of singleness. Um, in fact, that in a lot of culture, and particularly pronounced in evangelical church culture, uh, marriage oftentimes has this priority over singleness. And they want to really caution against that, especially given that the New Testament seems to you know, counter that in a lot of ways to say that um, it's actually the opposite way. Um, they do acknowledge the issues uh, related to same-sex marriage, and they say it needs to be addressed along three separate axes. Um, you have the ecclesial question, what should the church be doing? The legal question, what should be the law? And the moral question, what is right and wrong, wrong about it? Um, and those are not necessarily the same things. Like, there could be uh, you know, nothing ethically wrong with it, but it still not be allowed ecclesially, ecclesially for other issues. And this is, uh, you know, might be akin to the eating of kosher uh, in the Old Testament. That was not a moral issue. That was not an ethical issue. That was an ecclesial issue. Um, almost certainly the legal issue is going to be pulled out and as a separate issue from this. Um, so they do want to say that even if you are opposed to same-sex marriage from an ecclesial standpoint, that doesn't necessitate that you're opposed to, to it from a legal or a moral standpoint. That these are separate questions and that you really have to address it separately on each of these different axes. Okay, moving along, uh, chapter 11. Um, and they, they title this New Life. It, it's about, uh, you know, it's very much tied to this question of marriage and family. A lot has to do with reproduction and abortion, that kind of thing. So they want to, uh, they introduce this term of new one, um, which they feel is probably a little bit more useful and if you remember back to when we were talking about Hauerwas, um, how we talked about, you know, we talk in terms of pro-life and pro-choice, but we never actually get around to talking about abortion. We kind of miss the issue. Uh, and so this is an effort to address that language gap that happens. And so they want to talk about uh, new one. Um, and they want to say, okay, at what point would you does new one come into being as human life? Uh, and it's not just new life, but human life. And that's the real key distinction here. Because um, there's a lot of, you know, life that um, we're fine getting rid of. Cancer cells we're fine getting rid of. Um, at what point does it become human life? The question isn't when does life begin. The question is when does the new one become a human, a uh, human person, as it were. Uh, so some of the issues that they want to consider when addressing this, this is that um, a lot of these issues can be resolved through extended health care. Um, through ex extended access to education, through additional economic support and social support. Um, that there's a lot of these things that can, can help the issue. That really, if we address these four issues, um, the question of abortion becomes suddenly a less you know, pressing issue. Um, that if there is adequate social and economic support, if there is adequate education about these different things, we do have uh, you know, health care for, you know, especially maternal health care, um, that that's going to address a lot of the issues related to abortion just because the other concerns are taken care of. Uh, and they do want to acknowledge that we need to allow room for debate, whether you are pro-choice, pro-life, whichever side that you're going down to in that debate. And I'm using the terminology for convenience here. 
Um, but you still need to allow the other to have a voice. The one that with whom you disagree to have a voice in this. You need to allow for that to happen. So otherwise, nothing will be advanced if you refuse to allow that to happen. Okay. Um, so they talk about healthcare, which is also very much related to that, uh, health and sickness. Again, particularly prescient during these times. Um, and they point out, this is a well-known statistic now, that U.S. health care costs more than any other country per capita, yet it seems to re, you know, deliver subpar results. Um, speaking of you know, maternal mortality, U.S. Has, has, has actually has some of the worst maternal mortality in the developed world, um, despite spending two, three, four, five times as much per person. Uh, than other developed nations as well. So there's got to be something to do to address this. Um, and a big issue has to do with access to health care, and they do point that out. Um, but they do want to caution, kind of, uh, they're looking to kind of thread the needle between extremes here. Uh, so they do want to make sure that uh, care does not become an obsession, um, and care for our health does not you know, result in neglect of care for the neighbor. Uh, and they also want to caution against turning healthcare into a commodity. Um, and they, this is really kind of where the danger is as they see it. Um, this is probably going to be one of their most controversial areas, at least in uh, you know, where we are uh, in this particular class. So we'll have some questions about that uh, coming up. Um, so as far as uh, places to begin, as they say it, is can we come up with a way for proper funding to access health care? And to keep in mind the context in which this is written, um, this is uh, written around the same time. This is during uh, you know, the Obama presidency, um, I believe is when this came out. So we're talking in terms of this is after the American, uh, you know, the ACA um, had passed uh, or AHCA uh, had passed. So that's kind of the context that they're talking in here. Um, they do believe that everyone should have access to affordable basic care. Um, whether or not people have access to this more advanced levels of care, that's where they're going to allow a little bit more debate. Um, and they, they also want research to be focused on issues that affect the poor. And this is a real problem um, in a, the way that healthcare works in the U.S. is that there's a lot of research dollars, but they're spent kind of disproportionately on things that do not affect the most of the population. They tend to affect those who are um, on the higher end of the socioeconomic scale. So, um, you know, things like obesity uh, tends to get a lot of, uh, you know, research for it. But there are other issues that perhaps don't get as much, uh, like very little is done on maternal mortality, um, at least in the U.S. There, there's kind of, we know statistics, but there's not a lot done to address like how to improve that because it disproportionately affects the poor. Um, so this is just an issue of what they're talking about there. Um, the next chapters, um, chapters, sorry, chapters 13 and 14. Um, <clears throat> so again, they're, we're kind of linking those together here. Um, chapter, uh, you know, these have to do with kind of end of life issues, aging and uh, end of life. And they want to talk about, when, in, in the context of aging as people get older, that value is not tied to utility. There's a lot of dangerous talk about that. Um, I would argue, especially right now, uh, that you hear a lot of talk of, well, you know, older people, older persons, they're not particularly contributing members of society, so maybe that's worth sacrificing them for the sake of the economy. Um, they're on their way out anyway. And that's really not at all how we should understand value. Um, and there's a lot of dangerous talk of value in those terms. So they really want to caution against that. Um, and they also want to talk about that, uh, this is just kind of another way to put that, that a duty to care, a duty of care for a person is not tied to that person's ability to be productive. Um, worth instead, value instead, is solely because that person is made in the image of God and because God loves them. Uh, and then they also want to caution against this whole idea of siloing um, and this was in one of the other readings, you know, that we had previously looked at. Uh, that, you know, I think uh, I think it was Rowan Williams um, talking about aging. That a lot of times we tend to, you know, put people off. Like you have independent living centers or uh, you know nursing homes and that kind of thing, where people get to a certain age and then they're more or less segmented off. 
Uh, and so they're cut off socially and societally from all the other people. They, this is something that they want to caution against as well. Um, the next chapter talks about death and dying. Um, and they do want to, they make a, a really good point here that death cannot be the greatest evil because life is not the highest good. Life is still, they, they say, uh, the quote is a precious and inviolable good, but it's not the highest good. Um, and so because of that, death cannot be the greatest evil. It's still evil, but it's not the greatest evil. Um, they also want, but they do want to caution that death should not be um, a goal nor a means to a goal. So it can't be just, oh, well, I'm going to die to get to heaven or anything like that. That, that life is still valuable, um, and they do want to have that as part of the debate. Uh, which are about end of life decisions and that kind of thing. Um, okay. Um, the next chapter talks about uh, immigration and migration, that kind of thing. And I do want to put, point out that Jesus and his family were migrants. Um, this is the whole flight to Egypt thing, that they were not you know, part of that culture. So to keep that in mind, we're looking at this. Um, Jesus specifically calls out welcoming the stranger. Uh, and actually, you can look to other Old Testament passages. This frequently comes up that, that people are required to care for uh, the poor, the widow, the orphan, the stranger in your land. Uh, that there is an obligation to be concerned with them. That does not fit neatly into any political category. Um, they do recognize that security is a valid consideration. And the, uh, they do want to note that preservation of culture is some people's consideration. But they also want to point out the idea of preservation of culture um, is not really a biblical concept at all. And so when you talk about preservation of culture, they want to caution against that, that this should not enter into the debate at all uh, when we're talking about these different things. Um, and they talk about the difference between push and pull, immigration and migration, uh, crisis and that kind of thing, uh, that migrant smuggling is also an evil uh, and a wickedness, uh, and how immigration policies, they do recognize a need for immigration policies with that. Um, and they do want to kind of point out to the, caution against some of the false narratives um, they go along with this and that sort of thing. So, again, a lot of this is just opening debate. It's not solving the debate, but just something, some things to start thinking about as we address these different issues. All right, chapter 16 and 17, dealing with policing and punishment, are, are connected. Um, so they point out that when you're talking about policing, uh, state policing, that there are five imperatives. Uh, so that this has to be trump everything else. Um, you'll notice that among the five imperatives, justice is not one of them. Retributive justice does not enter into the conversation. And even if you look into like Robert P Robert Peel's rules for policing, um, that's also part of it. That there's this mythos in culture of policing as this warrior. They're going to get the bad guys, and that's what they're doing. Well, that is a means to an end. Um, the end is what the focus should be. That. This is for the betterment of society, this is for protection, that the imperatives for policing are to seek peace, defend poor, uh, to speak truth, to love neighbor, and to not act from a position of fear. Um, and, and to keep that in mind when we're looking at these different things. Uh, connected with that, uh, they start talking about punishment, um, and they do note out that the U.S. has a problem. Uh, they have the, the, a disproportionately high prison population compared to the populace. Um, I believe only China's is, is, or of those that report, is the only one that higher. North Korea probably, you know, would be significantly per capita higher, but they don't report that sort of thing. Um, but nevertheless, it is a problem. The number of people that are imprisoned in the U.S. is significantly higher than most of the developed world. Um, are we just going to say that, well, there's just that much more crime in the U.S.? I think that you'd be hard-pressed to make that case. Um, so there is you know, a higher incidence of imprisonment of those who have been to jail and those who are currently in jail. Those are both very high. And that this is disproportionately upon, um, you know, black males. Uh, African-American males or black American males um, are disproportionately affected by this issue. So how, how do we address that? Like, the, this is often termed the new racism um, or the new slavery or the new Jim Crow. Uh, that you do have this massive disparity uh, between the two. Um, despite the fact that crime seems to be, you know, equally perpetrated by both, uh, you know, whites and blacks, there is a much higher incarceration rate among black males. So, um, they want to talk in terms of a well-ordered society. Uh, they do want to say, like, it is important to name crimes, but you can't close off a future for criminals because this just perpetuates a cycle. So they want to instead focus on long-term resolution. They definitely has, have the idea of restorative justice, uh, 
um, and not retributive justice in this context here. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Coming on. Um, chapter 18, uh, talking about war and that kind of thing. Um, and they want to talk about that peace is the uh, is the goal of creation. That this is what the the focus of creation was. The goal of creation this is what was lost. This is what's moving again toward um, when we talk about uh, war. So anything we talk about war, and these are different questions to consider um, about just war and that kind of thing. Um, the next chapter uh, talking about uh, torture, which is less on the forefront now than it was probably at the time that this was written. Um, it was this was around the time that you know Guantanamo Bay and um, Osama bin Laden and all that was still you know very much in the news. Um, so, but the idea of torture uh, is that they give a definition for torture, um, and that the end result is that the victim of torture is less able to see humanity. And the torture is also harmed. And they say this is really not a question of whether or not torture is permissible. Um, for a Christian, it's not permissible. Instead, the only question is, what is it that actually constitutes torture? So where is the line on that? Okay, uh, the last chapter in this section uh, that they talk about all these different issues and convictions that they have um, is dealing with religious fr freedom. Um, and as uh, personally someone who's a Baptist, this is something near and dear to my heart. Um, you have this, you know, at the forefront, the some of the earliest advocates for complete religious freedom were um, Baptist Roger Williams, who founded Rhode Island, essentially for that sake. It, it's part of that tradition, as it were. Um, so uh, the idea is that Christians should not be surprised by persecution. They should perhaps even expect persecution, but they should never enforce their will on others. This isn't about protecting themselves over and against others, um, but rather protecting all religious faith or even non-faith as part of that as well. Um, so they also want to note that a lot of what people talk about when they use the term persecution is not actually persecution, it's inconvenience um, or just things that I don't particularly like. And that's not the same thing. Uh, so they do want to point to that um, and, and the difference between that. Um, Okay, uh, the last section, uh, which I'm going to kind of address here at the end, um, has to do with the virtues. So, they lay out the different virtues, um, courage, humility, justice, uh, respect, respect uh, and compassion. So, um, and, and you, know, you can read these different ideas, and the idea is... Um, this is really what they're getting at. And so you can see very strongly the influence of Aristotle or Aquinas, the, the Thomist influence there. Uh, and if you really want to get down to it, this is probably where the most productive work in Christian ethics is today, uh, as in discussion of along the lines of virtue and virtue ethics and that sort of thing. Um, usually understood in this kind of post-foundational context. Um, and this is right where Wolf and McNally lens, who... Um, theologically speaking, are, are on the more conservative end of the spectrum. They're the you know, post-liberalist uh, idea. So um, they do talk in terms of courage, uh, in, in terms of courage and humility, justice and uh, respect and compassion. That these are the virtues that should be cultivated, and that really, if we cultivate these virtues, that's going to end up um, resulting in right action. So. Um, this book is not really should should not be meant to be like uh, the end all be all. This is the thing to do. Just read it and accept it. Really, this is more of a you know a starting point for thinking about these things, discussing these things, talking about these things. Um, the idea that whatever you do is a public act, um, whether you want it to be or not. Uh, and so to really start thinking about these different issues and topics in that context. Okay, so. Um, I'll see you guys over on the discussion page, and um, you know, make sure that if you haven't read it, go ahead and read this book, submit your review on it. Um, if you haven't sent in your paper, submit your paper, uh, and you should have um, tomorrow at the latest Thursday, the final should be available for you. You're going to have a little bit of time to work on that and complete it then. All right, that's it, and I will uh, see you guys, like I said, over on the Blackbot page. Oh my gosh.
Oh, one. 